What's up guys, welcome to Vintage Genetics, where it is all about classic bodybuilding. And today I'm going to show you how I aim to train the legs every single time in order to make that weak point of mine be better, to grow. Uh, as you know, classic physique is a class all about classic bodybuilding. I've been promoting classic bodybuilding itself before the class classic physique was even invented. But back then I was still all about the golden era of bodybuilding, which was, uh, you know, nowadays would be a disproportional big upper body with a normal lower body muscular, but not as big as today's standard. So ever since I took it upon myself to create a physique like that, um, the legs were lacking behind when I started doing pro shows at a classic physique. So ever since then, I've been training the legs religiously and it's become more and more fun to challenge myself with the legs because let's face it, and especially also since I'm tall, but what I was going to say is the legs simply need more effort put into them compared to other muscle groups. For example, when I train the chest, if I just train hard, I know that it'll grow. However, for the legs, I can train as hard as I want. If there's not something intelligent behind it, intelligent thought processes, it won't grow as much as the upper body does. Like the arms will grow if I just do a lot of sets, a lot of volume, go to failure a few times without even really thinking about it. Of course, now I'm training a lot different compared to back then, but today I'll show you what I do intelligently to train the legs to make them bigger than before they already grew quite a lot compared to before but they still need to grow a little bit to come up to the same size as the upper body so as you can see i'm starting out with the leg curls a unilateral version so one time i do the laying leg curl with two legs and this time i do it with one leg that way i'm performing the exercise twice so training the hamstrings twice but under just a different angle just a different way of hitting it and i'm also doing quite a lot of warm-up sets before i do my first working set now this is my first working set and on my phone which i bring with me every single time i work out i have a workout log where i log my previous workout set max for example, on this one, it was seven reps of 32 and a half kilograms per leg. And now I hit eight reps, which means I beat my previous record. And whenever you beat a previous record, that means you're progressing. And strength is correlated to muscle mass, at least to some extent. So the stronger you get using full range of motion, a correct form, using the muscle that the exercise is intended for, if you get stronger then, you will inevitably grow muscle mass. And for legs especially, that is very true. Now I don't stick to only one working set to failure, but I stick to mostly two working sets. The first working set is the heaviest one, which is an 8 to 12 rep range. And then the lighter one, working set number two, is a 15 to 20 rep range. So whenever I hit 20 reps, I will go up in weight and try to hit 20 reps with that. And that's the way I progress on this one. And on this exercise, at this working set I progressed as well because I used to do around 18 or 19 reps before and now I can already do 20 full reps on this exercise I think even 21 reps which beats the previous record and allows me to go up in weight for the next session hitting trying to hit 20 reps with a heavier weight and in that way I could progress once more the benefit of using a unilateral movement is I can really focus on the contraction and the stretch of the hamstring that I'm really training if you use two legs at the same time sometimes you like to go quite heavy and the heavy weight uh, you know kind of involves the glutes a little bit as well with the unilateral heavy weights, it does to an extent, but with both legs, it can happen quite extensively. And you don't want that because this is an isolation movement. And an isolation movement is meant 
to isolate a muscle from the rest. So without using the glutes, you should be able to use the hamstring fully and isolated. And if you can't, you should simply go a bit lower in weight. Of course, there's always some extent where you use other muscles to balance or help out just a little bit, but it should be to an extent. And that extent is something you can only judge and uh, be subjective about when you're a professional doing it for a long time. When you're a beginner, you should really stick to isolating that movement without any other muscle groups helping you out. And then the hack squat. So in this workout session for the legs, I always do the hamstrings first. As I mentioned, either with both legs or unilaterally, I isolate the hamstrings first so that I get that out of the way because that's the biggest weak point in my legs. And then I move on to a heavy compound. So one time it's the Smith machine squat first, other time it's the leg press first, the hack squat first the belt squat first so i have a lot of options to start with and this time it's the hack squat so here i'm also doing quite a lot of warm-ups and that's very important for me because you know some people like to only do two or three reps with a the weight then move up in weight until they reach their working set weight but to me you simply haven't driven enough blood into the that area into the joints into the tendons into the muscle itself to protect you against injury. And that to me is very important because this will be my working set and it's quite a challenging one. I did 10 reps of 230 kilos before and this is 10 kilos heavier. So beforehand, you of course don't know if you're able to hit those 10 reps. So you really, for your you know feeling, have to hit it your all. You have to give it your all to hit those 10 reps because previously, you went to failure on that set with a lighter weight. So this time you need to beat the set you went to failure with the last session. So that's always a challenging thought. So that's why you will see me having some breathers in between reps sometimes to catch my breath because I don't want the oxygen to be the limiting factor. I want the muscle to be the limiting factor. Now my working sets on these heavy compounds is going to failure, but not past failure because you should only do that if you have an active spotter standing next to you because if I go to failure and pass failure here how am I going to get out of the machine and that's dangerous it's injury uh, uh, sensitive so and it also even if you go past failure it doesn't bring you that much more stimulus to grow muscle so the best way the safest way and the way for most longevity in the gym and as your bodybuilding career you should simply go to failure on most heavy exercises and don't try to go past failure because that will only risk injury risk not being able to control the weight etc now this is a second working set and it's a lot more reps i think at least 15 reps here that i hit with a lighter weight if not more reps so every time that I do a heavy working set, always afterwards a lighter working set, at least at most exercises, to work two different rep ranges in case that you don't beat one rep range, you can still try it again on another rep range, which allows you to get stronger. Even if you don't beat your maximum weight, you can still beat a volume set with a lighter weight with more reps. You also saw that I attached some elastic bands, some resistance bands around the hack squat. And I did the same here on this Swift machine. You can see it uh, not very clearly, but right after where the uh, red plate is in between the plate and the machine, you can see a resistance band. They aren't very strong, but what they do is they help me get out of the hole and not necessarily help me in terms of pulling me up, but it helps me by reducing the stress on my knees. So it's not to make the exercise easier for my muscles, it's to alleviate the stress on the knees, which is also why I'm wearing knee reps and also why I'm wearing uh, these shoes, these weightlifting shoes, all to eliminate uh, certain factors from the lift. The knee sleeves are to protect my knees, my joints. I don't really have any joint pain, but it's just to keep them warm to make sure that I don't hurt them. The same goes for the resistance bands. If you 
go upwards, the tension that the resistance bands uh, provide is less and less. So the higher you go, the more effort you have to do, and that's kind of on par with the strength curve. You're the weakest at the bottom and the strongest at the top. So that's exactly what the resistance band does. It takes most of the stress of your joints at the bottom and it doesn't help at all at the very top. So it works perfectly for that. I also mentioned I was wearing weight lifting shoes and I'm wearing those shoes to be able to go deeper below parallel. As you can see, I did that on the hex squat and I, I'm doing it on this Smith machine squat, keeping my back really straight, going uh, down as far as I can possibly go. I physically can't go deeper because my calves are pressing against my hamstrings, so I can't go deeper than this really. And that's why I adjusted my stance of my feet in such a way that I can go as deep as possible, get the best stretch on the quads, and also allows to keep my back straight. Because if I would be bending forward, a lot of tension, a lot of stress would be on the lower back. And is that what we're going to train in this exercise? No. What we're training is the quads mostly. A little bit of the glutes because I'm going quite deep, but mostly the quads. So I want to maximize the stretch and the stress on the quads and minimize the stress on any other muscle in the body. Usually my lower back would be the limiting factor and that's just horrible. After adding those resistant bands which help with the tension in the bottom and also wearing those weightlifting shoes, putting my feet further forward, which to me beats the hack squat mechanics for my structure personally, I can really work purely the quads and when I go to failure here I just feel the muscles of the legs go to failure and I don't go to failure because I'm tired I don't, don't go to failure because my lower back hurts I go to failure because my quads can't go on any much longer and that's how you grow muscle mass so you saw two working sets here first a heavy one and then a lighter one and it's relatively heavy because after having done one compound as heavy as you can already, you know, the second compound simply won't be as heavy as you could normally do if you would be starting with it. Obviously, there are exceptions because there are very strong bodybuilders out there. I'm just a regular bodybuilder, I've never really trained for strength, nor did it come naturally. On some exercises like the bench press, I could be quite strong, but on most other ones, I really focus on working the muscle and not about pushing as much weight as possible. I really do believe that saves your joints, it saves a lot of risk of injury. I've never had an injury in my life, at least not a major one, just minor naggings here and there like the shoulder nagging you or uh, the bicep tendon a little bit but I all fixed those because it wasn't really a major issue it wasn't caused by heavy weights it was more caused by repetitions and that's also something you want to look out for but not something that's as risky as using a very heavy weight so what I just did there is a unilateral leg extension. I did a few more sets there, but I didn't record that one. Really like the unilateral version because it allows you, just like those unilateral leg curls, to focus on the muscle individually and really go to failure instead of failing because you're too tired or the lactic acid would maybe stop you. If you only use, use one leg, it's way easier to just go until you literally can't go on any longer. Now this is an interesting one, it's an adductor exercise. So most gyms may have that machine where you put uh, both of your legs pretty much in a split and then bring them back together. A lot of females do this exercise as well, but it actually is a very good exercise for any bodybuilder because for a lot of people, as uh, you know, also me in particular, the inner thighs can be a lot bigger to give the illusion that the entire leg is bigger. Even if your quads, even if your hamstrings or even glutes are big, if the inner thigh or adductors are small, it still will look like that you have straight up and down legs, which I suffered for a very long time. Now I improved it a little bit. Still can use some mass on the inside, of course, and that's why I'm always isolating it 
with an exercise like this. I unfortunately don't have the machine. If you do have the machine, I recommend using that one. But this one gives you the unique ability to go unilaterally in a very isolated way. You don't have to focus on anything else. Just hold, hold on to yourself to make sure you keep standing straight to a pole on the other side. But for the rest, you can only feel that inner thigh working. And what I'm also doing, I'm wearing these uh, cuffs around my uh, ankles and uh, attaching them to the cable. And like that, I can do the exercise very easily without feeling any joint pain at all. Only feeling the muscles stretch and contract, especially the contraction part here is really severe because, you know, it's the maximum contraction I ever felt compared to those adductor machines. But the stretch is a little less, so you got to take something and give something with this exercise. But still, it's a great addition. And uh, sometimes I also do sumo squats, for example, on the belt squat to also hit those inner thighs. But I think isolating them is definitely something you should do if your inner, inner thighs are lacking just a little bit. And of course, we can't forget hitting the calves. Honestly, to be honest, I trained calves a whole lot back in the day, like a few years ago, uh, for seven, eight years straight. And then I kind of stopped for a year and a half to train them seriously. And I've slowly been incorporating them again, been doing them consistently for a few months again. And I have to say that I noticed them getting fuller, getting more detailed, actually getting more defined as I train them because the fullness of the calves will actually push harder against the skin and show more detail and simply because a bigger muscle will usually if trained properly show greater detail that's definitely something you should do even if it's a strong muscle group because my thinking was well my upper legs basically need some more mass so the lower legs shouldn't be growing as much but i think if you have a strong muscle group don't neglect it keep training it and make it stand out on stage especially when you know that most people don't share having the same strong muscle group for example the calves Okay guys, that was quite the intense workout, really liked it, actually felt it in the legs, the quads, the hamstrings, even the glutes, no lower back because of the techniques I use during the heavier compounds. When you're tall and your structure is different, you simply need to you know, apply techniques like that to make the training more efficient. We are bodybuilders, not weightlifters, we are sculptors of the body and you can sculpt more efficiently if you actually work the muscle to the max without the joints or other muscle groups in the process. Anyway, let me show you my post-workout meal. Obviously, let me put the camera right. It's not the whole meal. I already ate most of it. We have some white fish right here. It was about 250 grams. We have some rice right now, about 175 grams cooked rice with turmeric in there with ginger in there, um, pepper, and some salt. It's, you know, about half of what I normally would eat post legs, but I'm still in a mini cut. And we actually have some steamed, well, actually, sous vide prepared parsnip. Yes, parsnip. It's a low FODMAP vegetable. Tastes amazing, to be honest, and it's very healthy. And I cooked it sous vide in a sous vide machine, so in a container, vacuum sealed it, cooked it for two hours under a certain temperature, about 80 degrees, and it came out perfectly. Added some salt and pepper before putting it in the, in the bag, and then it came out real nice. And it's a way not to let these vitamins and minerals leach out into water, because it's not being cooked in water, it's being cooked in a vacuum sealed container, in a bag, so when you pull it out, it's the exact same, but then uh, also not cooked above 100 degrees, but cooked in a lower temperature for longer to make sure all the bacteria are gone to make it nice and soft. So that's it. And also a nice kiwi with the skin, because as I always say, the skin and right beneath the skin are digestive enzymes for digesting the protein. And the skin itself also has fibers in it, a little bit of fiber, you know, when I'm in the mini cut, and I know I just put out a video telling you guys 
not to eat fibers post-workout. Now, I don't have fats in here. I'm not taking any vitamin C, no vitamin E, uh, no anti-inflammatories, stuff like that. I am taking the bulk of my carbs in this meal because in this mini cut, all my other meals have a low amount of carbs and higher fats. So the protein I'm having now is being absorbed. And also before this, I had a whey isolate shake by becomegladiator.com. My own prepared whey isolate, 91% protein, one of the highest on the market. Um, but anyway, but there are a bit of fibers in here, but ooh, there's a hair there. That's not the fiber I want. But anyway, the fibers in here are, you know, it's kind of a trade-off because if you take off the skin, you don't have the digestive enzymes to digest the protein optimally. And if you do take off the skin, you have less fiber, but there's not a whole lot of fiber in here anyway. And it's uh, mostly carbs in this. But if you are, you know, in a super high caloric intake and you need it and you're a hard gainer, then sticking to only white rice and a simple to absorb carb like white fish post-workout would be the best option. And then taking all the healthy options around that meal so and on other um, times of the day where you do take in your fats the healthy fats all the fibers the vegetables the fruits to gain not only muscle but also vitamins and minerals to aid in muscle protein synthesis and protein metabolism anyway guys that's it for now thank you for watching and don't forget to stay golden <laughs>